gift it is to be together. We've come together today to worship our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's start by singing this chorus together. this but we are in a teaching series called over it and this weekend we are talking about putting peace over anxiety my name is Lindsay and this morning I'm gonna share my story with you of how I did just that I can't tell you when my anxiety started for the first time to be honest with you when I look back on my life I see anxiety all over it like a dark looming shadow weighing me down, filtering my thoughts, sending me reminders of worst case scenarios and telling me how insignificant and worthless I am. I can't tell you where it all started, but I can tell you when I first started looking for help. 
It was four years ago. I was 22. I had just got married and just moved 10 plus hours away from everyone I knew for a job here at Church on the Move. I was hiding in my closet, hyperventilating, terrified that a small error I had made that day would ultimately lead to the crumbling and shutting down of Church on the Move. Yes, it's an irrational thought. I see that now. <laughs> when my husband entered the closet and he said, I think you need to see a doctor. So I did. I got on some medication and I started taking it. Fast forward a year and I was in a Real Jesus small group, confiding in some girls about how crippling it is to believe that you're more in control than God is. I believed that no matter how big or how small, when I did something bad, I was something bad. That if I made a mistake, I was unlovable. Since then, God has revealed to me more and more faulty thinking in my life, but each time he has introduced a practice for surrendering to him and finding peace. I go to counseling, I take my medication, I practice breathing, I don't drink coffee, I sit down and journal, and I had no idea <laughs> that these seemingly useless decisions to move toward God would add up to the discipline I was missing in my life. I'll wrap up with this. In June 2019, we did a teaching series called Hope Rising here at the church. We had a little card. It said, what could an infinite God do? We were supposed to write some big hopes on it. I wrote down that an infinite God could rewire my brain. I thought that it was an outlandish request. But that is what he is doing. If you ask me all of the little things that I do each day to get over my anxiety, the list might seem daunting, but it doesn't feel that way to me because over the past four years, God has slowly, at a rate that I could keep up with, introduced these practices to me and through them, he has reshaped the way I live and move and find my being. God is good. I know what it's like to feel so hopeless that you cannot breathe. This morning we are getting ready to sing a song called Breathe. How good is that? If you are in this room this morning and you are desperate for hope, if you are desperate for joy, if you're desperate for peace, can I tell you something? You are desperate for Jesus and he is here. There is peace in him. I want to challenge you. Make this next song your prayer this morning. Would you stand to your feet? Let's worship him. This is 
generations and your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations in your family and your children and their children and their children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and the children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and the children and the children and the children may his presence go before you In your business, He is with you. In your workplace, He is with you. In your home, He is with you. In your mess, He is with you. If our God is with us, if our God is for us, who can stand against? We're not alone this morning. Whatever you came in here carrying, Whatever burden you feel like you're under, you're not alone. Our God is with us. If he could meet Joseph in a prison, if he could find Moses in a desert, if he could show up for David on a battlefield, he can meet you where you're at this morning. Come on, church, on the move, let's give our God praise. Father, we thank you. We worship you. You're so good. Diana, let's sing that last part, just one more, that first part one more time, just that the blessing that we sing every week. Yeah, let's sing that together. Make that your prayer this morning.
Sing it again. Sing it over your family, over your kids, over your business. Sing it. Let's seal it with amen. Lord, we love you. We thank you. You never leave us or forsake us, but you're with us. And everything that we face and everything that we're going through, even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil because you are with us. Your face shining toward us. You got a smile on your face and in your eyes because you love us. We love you. We worship you. We praise you this morning. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, amen. Come on, church. Give God praise one more time this morning before you're done. Yes. And give it up for this band for leading us in worship as well. Thank you. So good. Well, have a seat. Welcome and good morning. If you're new here, my name is Witt and uh, I am the pastor here and I'm just so thrilled that you're with us this morning. We are in part two of a series called Over It and here in just a few minutes, Pastor Ethan Vance, our pastor from Broken Arrow, is going to be preaching to us about how to have peace over anxiety and I heard the sermon last night. It is incredible. I'm so glad he is preaching this weekend and you will be too uh, after you hear the sermon. So that's coming up here in just a moment. But if you're new, do me a favor, grab your phone right over where you're at. Just grab it. And if you're online, you can do the same thing. Grab your phone and text the word new to 23101. First of all, we want to just send you a $5 Starbucks gift card just to say thanks for being a part of Church on the Move this weekend. But secondly, we want to get connected to you. And we know that coming to a big church, it can often feel like you're just kind of a face in a crowd, but that's not how we feel. We want to get to know you, start to hear a little of your story, and maybe help you take a little bit more of a deeper journey into the life of what's happening here at Church on the Move. Now, if you've been here for a while, And maybe you're just not really plugged in yet, but you're looking to kind of take a step and go deeper. And honestly, I think that's one of the best things that you could do at the start of the year. Would you grab your phone and text the word NEXT to 23101? What that's going to do is connect you with our Next Move team. And the Next Move is simply the way that you get connected at Church on the Move. It's a way to take us a big church and make it a small church. It's a little bit like entering a a, a six lane highway when you're first learning how to drive coming to Church on the Move. It's a little bit intimidating. Feels like, you know, it's a little bit scary to merge into all that traffic. I get it. That's what the next move is all about. If you will text next to 23101, we'll connect with you and help you get connected to what's happening at Church on, on the Move. So do that. And that's really what this whole season right now is about. It's about taking next steps and engaging. I can tell you, your 2021 will be so much better. Forget what happens out there in the world. Forget all the crazy that goes on. It'll be better for you, I promise you, if you'll make a determination right now to take a step and get engaged and be a part of what God is doing. And it's it's not just so that we can have big numbers at our church, but honestly, this is what the church is about. It's about deepening our community and getting into relationship with each other. And one of the ways that we do that is through small groups and mid-sized groups. And we've got a lot of those launching right now. And uh, my good friend Chris Munch put together a video to kind of tell you a little bit about all that's happening with our groups right now. So check this out. Well, hello everyone, Chris Munch here. I wanted to talk to you about something fresh and new happening with our groups here at Church on the Move this year. Starting Wednesday night, February 3rd, Church on the Move is launching five, count them, five new mid-sized groups. What is a mid-sized group? A mid-sized group is a group of small groups that are all linked together that make up 
a bigger group, or some might even call it a mid-sized group. So it's a great way to get to know people at your table, but you're also engaged in a larger group as a whole. So you really get the best of both worlds. And here's the cool thing. We are actually able for the first time to provide on-site childcare for these groups. That's right, parents, bring your kids. It'll be awesome. So what are the five different groups? Well, we've got a group for the men of Church on the Move. We've got a group for the women of Church on the Move. We've got a group for the parents of Church on the Move. We've also got a Genesis Bible study group where you can dive deeper into scripture. And we also have a mid-sized group going through Church on the Move's Real Jesus curriculum. I'm excited about all of the groups, but especially the Real Jesus group because I have the honor of co-hosting the group with my good pal, Lindsay Behill. And this week, I had the opportunity to sit down with myself and hear a little bit more about the vision behind a real Jesus group. So check it out. Well, here we are, Chris. Thank you so much for getting me on your schedule. Thanks for taking the time. I know you're super busy, highly sought after. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, uh, my pleasure. <laughs> you know, I have to I have to be honest. Uh, I'm kind of embarrassed to say this, but I'm a bit of a fan. Kind of been a, you know, I've always uh, admired you from afar. <laughs> like now you're uh, now you're gonna make me blush uh, because that that means a lot. Uh, you know, uh, coming from you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let's I t let's just jump right in. You know, tell me what what is the real Jesus? Um, you know, what's this group gonna really be about? I, I think it's gonna be really um, good. Wow, <laughs> that is so good. Well, that's our time. Chris, thank you so much. Oh, well, hey, no, my pleasure. Thank you, thank you. No, I hope you're as excited about this group as I am. For more detailed information about all of our mid-sized groups, go to churchonthemove.com slash groups, or just text midsize to 23101, and do not forget to sign up for free child care. Thanks so much, we will see you there. Awesome. So anyway, we're launching those groups here in February. And if you text midsize to 23101, you can get connected. Or if you'll text groups, we've got so many different ways you can text us to find out what's going on around here. Text groups to 23101 and you can find out what's happening with all of our small groups. So many ways to get plugged in and go deeper. Well, hey, before we jump into the rest of our service, I want to give us an opportunity to, to give and uh, if you want to do that, you can do it a couple different ways. One, you can text GIVE to 23101 and follow the prompts there. And, uh, and then also, if you would like to give to our Compassion Offering, which, by the way, if you didn't hear last week, we're already at $2.3 million. In fact, more than $2.3 million, which is awesome, toward our $3.25 million goal. Super excited about that. If you want to give to that, you can text CO and, uh, to 23101 and then follow the prompts. Super easy to do that. Let me pray over our giving this morning, and then I got one more announcement to make before we jump into the service. So let's, uh, let's do that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. Thank you for your generosity to us. And uh, Lord, thank you for this faithful congregation. So many people here who give, who are faithful to honor you with their tithes, with their offerings, giving to our compassion offering. Father, I pray a blessing over them, over their business, over their career, over, Lord, what you've put in their hand. I pray, Lord, you would multiply it and grow it so that they could continue to be a blessing. I pray, Father, that you would take these gifts and use them to reach and bless people. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, look up here. Hey, last week I told you um, that I had a big announcement to make about our church in Gloompool. Now, if you didn't know, we are a family of churches. We do the multi-site thing like several other churches do. But we don't do it via video. I, in other words, what I teach here isn't being broadcast out to other locations. And not that I think that there's anything wrong with that. I just feel like that the way that God has led us is to have churches in each of our communities, not just campuses. To have pastors in each of our churches, not just campus pastors. Someone who could preach and lead and build that local church. And a couple of years ago, when we kind of shifted away from doing video teaching in each of our churches to installing senior pastors in each of those churches, um, my brother Gabe had just moved back from California, and um, I was looking for someone to kind of take the lead at our church in Glimpool, and I tapped Gabe and his wife Summer on the shoulder. I said, would you take and lead and pastor this church? And they said, yes, we would love to do that. And for the last two years, they have been faithfully 
loving and pastoring our church in Glimpool. But about nine months ago, Gabe just had a stirring in his heart that there was something new God wanted to do, that he was to kind of step away at some point, not immediately, but at some point he was going to be stepping away from our church in Glimpool to pursue a dream that honestly God had put in his heart before they even moved back to Tulsa. And so we knew, okay, that means we're going to have to find a new pastor for our Glimpool location. And so we began a search for a pastor who was who would be perfect for that church. And it meant for us doing a nationwide search because we didn't just want anybody to step into this. We wanted the right family and the right fit. And so after literally thousands of people applied for this job and we interviewed so many different candidates, flew people to Tulsa, met with families, met with our team. I mean, just the whole thing, as you could imagine, we found who I believe are a great, great, going to be a great fit for our Glimpool Church. And their names are Seth and Kim Swindoll. Here's a picture of them. Seth is actually out there preaching this weekend at our Glimpool Church. We've already walked all of this through with them. We've been pastoring and leading that congregation through this. So this is a news to them today. But I just wanted to share with you a little of what's happening out there because we're one church, even though we meet in different locations. And so Seth and Kim are stepping in out there. They got five beautiful daughters, and we are so thrilled to have them be a part of our Church on the Move family. You'll get to meet Seth. He'll be here preaching before you know it, and I can hardly wait to kind of introduce him to you. But if you see Seth and Kim either online or in person, welcome them, give them a hug, and tell them welcome to the Church on the Move family. We are super excited for them. And be praying for my brother Gabe. Everything is so good there. God has done so much in them. They're going to be taking a step off of the Church on the Move team and out into something new that God has for them. And we're super excited. Honestly, the last two years of having them here have been so good. And I really believe it was a season for them of healing and just from some things that they had been through. And, and as a family, we have never been better, tighter, closer. God is good, and I'm so thankful for their season and for their faithfulness here in Church on the Move. And you'll see and hear from Gabe and Summer again. They're not gone, but uh, they're pursuing their next and what God is doing there. So we're really excited about that and uh, excited about Seth and Kim coming on board. So I wanted to share that with you this morning. God is good. All right. Are you ready to hear from Pastor Ethan this morning? All right. Well, I'm going to let them roll this video, and then we'll jump right in. So let's do it. Hey, good morning, Church on the Move. How you doing? It's great to see you. Hey, if you're grateful and thankful to see the hand of God on our churches and God moving and God providing in one of the craziest seasons ever, would you just make some noise? Put your hands together. Let's fill this place with some praise to our God. I can't tell you how excited I am to see what God is doing, not only in uh, all, you know, you know, all of our churches, but specifically in this church. As many of you knew, know, I grew up here. Uh, this is home base for me still. And uh, to see what God is doing in you and your families, to hear the stories every week of life change, to hear from Pastor Wood and Pastor Lee and the team about what, what God is doing in your lives is absolutely phenomenal. I still love Church on the Move Broken Arrow a little bit more, but just this much more. Come on, you know what I'm talking about. We're, we're so glad to be with you today. Thanks for uh, being so gracious and, uh, and helping us uh, do what we're doing out at Church on the Move Broken Arrow. Everything that we do at our church is a reflection of what God is doing in your church. So everything that is good, every praise report we have, every bit of ground gained for us is ground gained for you and a little, a little jewel in your crown in heaven for what God is uh, doing through you in us. And we're so, so, so grateful. Uh, I want to ask you a question this morning. How many of you the two little words that we're talking about to start this year describe how you feel. How many are over it, over it? Like, I don't know what it is for you, but I just think, yeah, it's just like, that's the feeling of life right now. I am over it. I had a, a perfect example of this in the grocery store the other day. I walked in the grocery store, and I was doing my thing. Honestly, I'm... I'm a dude, so sometimes I'm a little oblivious to what's going on, and I'm just shopping. I'm just trying to make sure I remember everything my wife sent me there to get. And so I'm, I'm, I'm walking to checkout, and as I'm walking to checkout, 
there's a lady in front of me who's at the register. And she turns around, scowls at me through, you know, through her mask and her eyes. She pulls her mask down a little bit. She says, son, please back up, to which I realize I have gotten to, to about five and a half feet away from her. I think I was like five and a half point five two seven away from her, and my, my toes were on the edge of the little red circle, to which I, I, I said, hey, I'm sorry, you know, I wasn't, you know, certainly, you know, want to respect your space, and I understand we're all processing this differently. I said, absolutely, so I back up a little bit, and as I'm backing up, a big burly dude behind me with a shopping cart rams my legs. I'm not talking about a love tap or a bro nudge, I'm talking about a full-on battering ram to the door, bam, to my calves and said, bro, move up. What do I do? Offend the nice little lady in front of me or get in a fight with the burly dude behind me? I don't know. I can't, and this was just a perfect example of how life feels today. I can't get close enough. I can't stay far enough away. I can't vote right. I can't look right. I can't, I can't think the, the right thoughts about a vaccine or about the election or about our economy. I, don't, I can't have the right color of skin. I can't do anything right, so what do I do? I'm just always stuck in the middle and I'm over it. Come on, somebody, you know what I'm talking about. Now, it's great, right? We're over it. Let's pray and go home. The problem with that is this. The problem with that is that it's one thing to feel over it. It's another thing to get over it. It's one thing to be fed up. It's another thing to actually make progress. It's another thing to actually move forward. And so what I love about how we're starting our year is that we're taking each week to look at some of the most specific places where some of the most personal things that impact our life the deepest, we feel over it. And maybe left to ourselves, we're not quite sure what to do exactly, how to move forward. We have all the feelings, but maybe not the steps. And so what we wanna do is we wanna take a look at what God's word has to say about getting over it, specifically today in the area of mental health. Is it possible for us to have peace over anxiety? And here's what I love about God's word is that God's word is forever settled in heaven. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God didn't get to 2020 or 2020. Oh, you know that book we gave him? <laughs> Guys, we need a new one. That one's not gonna work anymore. We know everything that you need for life and godliness is contained right here. And so if we carefully look at God's word, there is an answer for everything that we're feeling over. Every place where we feel frustrated and we don't know what to do, God knows exactly what to do, amen? So we're gonna take a look today at, I believe, one of the uh, most uh, pivotal verses and passages on mental health, specifically anxiety. And we're gonna take a look at Philippians chapter four, starting in verse four. These are the words that Paul wrote about this subject specifically. Now, I wanna just take a second before we read this passage and just address the, the idea of anxiety for a second. Anxiety is a very real thing. Each of us deal with stress, depression, anxiety, uh, feelings of worry in different ways. Some of us deal with them on one extreme side of the spectrum where it's actually, maybe for you, it's affected you at some point in your life physically. It's caused you to have a panic attack. It's caused you to have feelings of the world being overwhelming and you're not sure what to do. It's, 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 it's caused you to close life in on yourself, to hide from the world. Uh, I have friends who have been rushed just in the last year to the hospital thinking they're having a heart attack. Young guys, uh, only to find out that it's not a heart attack, it's a panic attack that the stress they were dealing with caught up to them in such a way that it caused them to have a physical response to what was happening internally. Others of us deal with stress you know, on a little bit of a lighter level. We're optimists, maybe you're like me, I'm an optimist, and so when it comes to the idea of anxiety, I feel a little bit like, hey, let's not talk about it at all because it's all just gonna work out, it's gonna be just fine, why do we even need to talk about it? Let's just keep moving forward. Others of you are pessimists and you're thinking, even it doesn't matter what you say because it's all falling apart, we're going to hell in a handbasket, it doesn't matter what you say, it's all gonna be horrible. So wherever you fall on the level of stress or anxiety, I want you to know today that God's word and God personally takes this very, very seriously. He cares about what you care about. He knows what's going on in your heart. He knows where you're hurting. In fact, I know from talking to several friends that we have people attending each of our churches this morning and several joining online that this is the first time you've been back in church in a long time because of some social anxiety that you have. 
some things that you're dealing with internally. And I just wanna tell you, we're so glad that you've leaned into this conversation. We're so glad that you're here. I believe God wants to do something in your heart and speak to you personally. And as we do, I just want you to hear that wherever you're at, God has an answer. You're not too far down the road in this that God can't help you. So here's what Paul writes, Philippians chapter four and verse four. He says this. Now, keep in mind, when Paul writes this, Paul is writing maybe the most pivotal verses on joy, peace, and happiness in all of the Bible. But Paul is writing these verses from prison, meaning that what Paul writes here, Paul, Paul, Paul is not sitting next to a fireplace in a cozy robe with his comfortable slippers smoking a pipe, and he's just having a great day, and he goes, oh, Jeeves, hey, come over here, grab a quill, my friend, and let's write down some of the wise thoughts that I've had in my old age for those Christians. I don't know why Paul is British all of a sudden, but <laughs> Paul's not sitting in comfort writing these verses. Paul is in solitary confinement with scars on his back from being beaten. He's been ridiculed, he's been ostracized. Paul has been mistreated and misunderstood. Paul is in the lowest possible place that he could be physically, but yet he writes some of the most spiritually rich verses in all the Bible, which ought to give you the first clue to your answer for peace, that peace is not found in your circumstances, that peace starts spiritually, that there's something besides what's happening in the world around us that's actually the anchor and the source of our peace. Paul says this, rejoice, Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Now, we are one sentence, five words, right? One, two, well, five words in and I already disagree with Paul. Rejoice in the Lord always, always. How about always with an asterisk? How about always with like a 2020 clause? How about always except for what you're going through? No, Paul says rejoice in the Lord always. In fact, Paul repeats that same command in the very next sentence. He says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Paul's a great pe preacher. I must say it again for the people in the back row. Rejoice in the Lord. Why is Paul saying that? Because he knows Ethan's gonna disagree. He knows Ethan's gonna go, yeah, that's great for you, Paul, but what about me? And this is why I think it's so profound to understand where Paul is writing this. If Paul can say rejoice in the Lord always, I can say rejoice in the Lord always, no matter what I'm going through. And he says this, let your gentleness be evident to all. It's an interesting thought to throw in to a study on peace, but your gentleness ought to be what you're most known for. And what Paul says is what you're most known for is a great indicator on, uh, of what's going on the deepest in your heart. So one of the great tests that you can have of your peace level is to ask, what do people around me know me most for? What do people see the most when they interact with me? Am I on edge, am I angry, am I angsty, am I, am I sort of always frustrated with what's going on, or are, am I known for gentleness? Are my interactions with people gentle? I think that's a great verse for Christians in 2021. Let your gentleness be made known to all men. All men, all women that vote different, look different, talk different, live different. Let your gentleness be made known to them because your gentleness on the outside is a great indicator of your peace on the inside. And then he says, the Lord is near, which is, again, an indicator that where peace starts is not from a natural source, but a supernatural source. He reminds you that God is close, and if God is close, your peace can be high. Do not, and then we get to the famous verses. Do not be anxious about anything. It's a pretty bold statement. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And then what happens? The peace of God, which transcends all our understanding, or passes over, or is superseding all of our understanding, that will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. And then Paul says, finally, my brothers and sisters, as if everything else that I've given you is enough to work on for a lifetime, I've got one more thought for you. He says, whatever is true, whatever's noble, whatever's right, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put these into practice. And what happens? The peace of God will be with you. Paul says that there is not just a, um, a, a, a spiritual hope that we have to have peace, but there are actually practical things that you can do in your life, no matter where you find yourself, to allow anxiety to go down and peace to go up. And I'm so thankful that Paul, in one of the worst circumstances of his life, takes time to write these verses to us to help us understand how to follow God when we're not sure what to do. 
When it feels like we're stuck in the middle and we wanna move forward, Paul says, I wanna give you a couple of things that will help you take ground in the area of your mental health, how your heart feels, what your mind is going through. I wanna help you with this, and the first thing that Paul tells us is this. He says, you have to start thankfully. Start thankfully. Start what, thankfully, Ethan? Everything. Start everything, thankfully. In fact, this is what Paul says directly in verses four uh, four and six in Philippians four. He says, rejoice in the Lord always, always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be made known to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. But in what situations are we to give thanks? In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Thankfulness is one of the most powerful tools that a follower of Jesus has to combat anxiety. Thankfulness is not just words of gratitude toward God. Thankfulness is not even just kindness toward other people. Thankfulness is a heart issue. And throughout the Bible, thankfulness and wholeness are directly connected ideas. In fact, in Luke chapter 17, there's a fascinating story about Jesus healing 10 lepers. And just the fact that Jesus heals 10 lepers is a remarkable thing because as you, let me just Bible geek out on you for a second. As you read through the Old Testament, there's only two places where a leper is healed and one of those places is Moses' sister. Moses' sister had leprosy for 10 hours and she was healed. Jesus shows up and he says, you think it was a big deal that somebody that had leprosy for 10 hours is healed? Watch me heal 10 guys that have been dealing with leprosy their entire life. In other words, when Jesus shows up, he says that there is supernatural power from God that's available for what you're going through. And so one of the first things that we see is that it, it, should, it should give you confidence to say this, don't ever doubt, for, not for one second, that God is able to heal what you're going through. You say, Ethan, where I'm at mentally, the things I'm going through, the stress, I, 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 I don't know if I can get over that heartache. I don't know if I can move past what's happened to me. I don't know if I can get over the stress that I'm feeling. It's too much. Just let me, let me tell you this. Where Jesus is, there is more than enough power for what you're facing. And when Jesus shows up, he heals these 10 guys. And these 10 guys do, I think, what any of us would do. They start running back to life. They go, ah, this is, and they're gone. They're running back to life. And then one of these guys, while they're running away, goes, wait a minute. Maybe, instead of running back to everything that's caused me pain and heartache, maybe I should run back to the one that just brought me healing. And so he turns around, he runs back to Jesus, he falls at his feet, and this is what Luke 17, 14 says, it came to pass, and they're going, these 10 were cleansed. If you're taking notes, circle that word, they were cleansed. And one of them, having seen that he was healed, turned back and glorified God with a loud voice. He fell at Jesus' feet and he, he gave thanks to him. He was a Samaritan. And Jesus, having answered, said, weren't there 10 guys that were cleansed, but where are the other nine? Was there none found, having returned to give glory to God except this foreigner? In other words, where's everybody else's gratitude at? And then he said to him, rise up and go. Your faith has cured you. Circle that word cured. Your faith has cured you. There's a difference in the verbiage between the, the nine who were cleansed and the one who was cured. The King James says that uh, the, the nine were healed, but the one who returned to give gratitude was made whole. There's a difference in the level of his connection to God. There's a difference in the level of what God's able to do in his heart, not because God didn't wanna do everything that he did in the one with the other nine, but something that the one did opened up his heart more for God to do more. Thankfulness is not just about you being grateful to God. It starts there, but it is so much more, friends. Gratitude is not God being uh, sort of uh, having a big ego and needing you to pay attention to him. No, thankfulness is a tool that God has given you in order to open your heart for healing. And there's more that God wants to do than just take care of the symptoms of anxiety and the symptoms of stress in your life. God wants to make you whole, and the wholeness that he wants to bring to you is found in your thankfulness. Where do you start thankfully? Everywhere. Especially the places where you feel the most stress and you feel the most anxiety. If you will make a practice of starting thankfully, you will find God show up in those moments and begin to lower your anxiety and raise your peace. Let me give you an example. We're gonna dismiss service here in a little bit. When we do, you're gonna go pick up your kids. Some of you dudes are gonna to have to go pick up your kids because your wife ended up talking and you're gonna go out there and you're hungry because Ethan preached too long and you walk out there and you get in line and there's like 10 people to pick up kids in front of you and you're angry and you're upset and you're starting to feel some of those things, some of those shopping cart moments start welling up in your heart. Here's what I want you to do, just start thankfully. What do I, what do I, what, what could I possibly be thankful for, Ethan? I don't know, find something. Just find something. Just go, okay, God, I want to be thankful. What, 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 can I, what can I be thankful for? 
Thank you that my kids are healthy enough to be in a public place. Thank you that my kids are in a place where they're learning about Jesus. Thank you that there are people who are willing to give up their Sunday morning to teach my kids about God. Thank you that in the middle of a world that has no answers, my family is anchored to a family of faith where we're finding answers for everything that we're facing. Thank you. And all of a sudden, your thankfulness starts to turn something on inside of you. And here's what happens with thankfulness. <laughs> thankfulness changes the direction of your heart and your mind. What happened with the nine is they're running back into life. They got what they thought they needed from Jesus and they're fine on their own. But the one guy who was thankful changed the direction of his life and he focused on Jesus. And because he was thankful and his focus changed, everything in his heart changed as well. Thankfulness is what hijacks the direction of your stress the direction of your thoughts, the direction of your anxiety. So as you're moving through life and you see stress start to grow, the first way that we find healing is not by finding an answer, but finding something to be thankful for. That hijacks the direction that I'm heading. And instead of heading toward more stress, more anxiety, more worry, it turns me around and it heads me back toward Jesus. And I say, I don't know how all the answers are gonna work out. But thankfulness reminds me that the same God who worked in the past will work in the future. It reminds me that even though I don't have everything that I want, where I'm at ain't bad, baby. We've got, God's done some good things. There are some good things that we can be thankful for. We don't have every answer for how 2021 is gonna work out, but I can tell you this, you live in a country surrounded by people who are still trusting God in the middle middle of chaos. We're still seeking God. We're still crying out to God. And I know that wherever there are people who love God and cry out to God, God shows up and God works. Be thankful you live where you live around the people you live around, even when it feels like it's falling apart because God is at work. Amen? Amen. Thankfulness changes your direction. But Paul says thankfulness by itself will get you started, but it's not where you stop. So the second thing I want you to do is in your process of being thankful, I want you to turn that thankfulness into a specific prayer. He says, I want, you to, I want you to start thankfully, but then I want you to pray specifically. Pray specifically. What does that mean? It means that as we're going to God, general prayers will get me started, but specific prayers will bring me clarity. This is what Paul says in Philippians 4, 6. He says, don't be anxious about anything, yes, but in every situation with prayer and petition, starting with thanksgiving, present your what to God? Your requests. Present your requests to God. So here's the challenge. In the battle against anxiety, one of the things that throws gas on your anxiety and your stress is avoidance. But yet it's what every human heart is wired to do when it comes to pain. When it comes to things that bother us, hurt us, or drive us crazy, the thing we want to do is avoid those things, especially if you're like me and you're an optimist. It's just like, let's just pretend, let's just hide under the covers and pretend the monster goes away, right? It's like, let's just avoid that. I don't want to go there. But in order to live out what Paul says to do here, to be able to pray a specific prayer, I have to know that there's a specific problem. So specific prayers always require a little bit of silence, solitude, and seeking God. This is really difficult when you're battling a mental health issue. Because the thing we don't wanna do is slow down long enough for life to catch up with us. But over and over again in the life of Jesus, we see that the crazier things got around him, the more often he withdrew to a quiet place. If Jesus needed to do it, so do I. If Jesus needed to do it, so do you. And one of the things that happens as we spend a little bit of time in silence and solitude, is we're able to identify the thing under the thing. Most of the time, what you find is when you're dealing with stress and anxiety, the thing that triggered you is almost never the thing that's really bothering you. And when you, if you wanna have peace and deal with anxiety, you can't just deal with the fruit growing on the tree, you have to find out what the root is. But so the challenge is, one of the things I wanna do the least is actually the most important for me to take a step back and to go, God, I'm hurting. I'm stressed, I'm anxious, and I'm worried. Will you help me understand what's causing this? What's under the thing? Years ago, I remember standing in the closet in my house and uh, I was hanging up a shirt, I'll never forget, and I was mad at a friend, a good friend, a guy that I love still to this day, I was mad at him. We had a little bit of a you know, an argument sort of that day, and we disagreed about something that was happening at work. I was hanging up my shirt, 
And as I was hanging up my shirt, the Holy Spirit got a hold of me. And this doesn't happen all the time to me, so don't think this is like some, you know, I always hear from the Holy Spirit. That guy's really spiritual. It's just, it's one of those things you remember. And as I'm hanging up the shirt, uh, I felt like God say, how many people has that been this week? It's like, I don't, what business of that is yours? Well, like, I just want to be mad at the dude. Like, let, let me alone. I, I'm kind of enjoying my anger right now. And as I'm hanging up the shirt, I realized, well, I was mad at her on Monday. I was mad at him on Wednesday. I was mad at her again on Thursday. It's him today. It's probably going to be her again tomorrow. And I started realizing maybe, maybe my problem isn't that other people are all out to get me and they're all like, they're all stupid people and I'm just around a bunch of knotheads and everybody's an idiot but me and I got it all. Maybe the issue's me. Maybe I got something going on right now. Like, okay, God, what's going on? And I started realizing that the common denominator between every place that I had been upset that week with people was I wasn't getting my way. That's not fun, guys. That's like, God, just, what are you doing? But what happens is now I can start to deal with the issue under the issue, and I can start to say, okay, God, if that's the issue, now my prayer can turn specific. God, will you help me to lay down the thing that I'm most worried about so I can serve people well and follow you best? Paul says that the specificity of your prayer matters to God. Why does the specificity of your prayer matter to God? Because God has always wanted partners. And he wants you to be aware of what's going on so you can work on it together. The specificity of your prayer has power in helping you find peace over anxiety. If you want, here's why. Stress, anxiety, worry, depression, they thrive in ambiguity. When things are unknown, stress is usually high, anxiety is high. When you don't know what to do, if you've ever had uh, to go to the doctor and get a test, you know exactly how this feels. While you're waiting for the test results, you don't know if you should throw a party because you're healthy or start a prayer circle because you're sick. It's just you're just living in the unknown. The enemy loves to leave God's people in the unknown. Because as long as things are vague, he can keep you from moving back, he can keep you from moving forward, he can just keep you stuck. But the second you can name what it is you're going after, your faith starts to catch fire, you can find a promise from God's word to stand on, you can pray a specific prayer and you can start to take ground because you know your enemy and you know your strategy and the enemy hates that. He doesn't want you to do that, so he wants you to stay in the vague, the nebulous, the ambiguity of it all. One of the most powerful things you can do for your mental health and the status of your heart is to say, I know exactly what I'm believing God for next. Here's what it takes, though. It takes a little bit of faith to give up the end to trust God for the next step. Because the end is vague. I don't know how it's all going to work out. I don't know how we're all going to get there. But I do know my next step. So I have to turn my faith for everything to my faith for the next thing. But you'll find when you can name your next step, pray a specific prayer, that you start to have a boldness you didn't have before. You start to have a confidence in God that you didn't have before because I know that God is at work and I know that I've been specific. This is what Psalm 139 says. It says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my what? Anxieties. This prayer from Psalms is a great place to start. God, what's going on in here? What am I anxious over? What am I really battling? Because I need to know what to do next. Specific prayers, specific prayers create clarity and confidence. You wanna have confidence, you wanna have clarity in your walk with God, pray specific prayers. And the last thing Paul says is he says, I want you to meditate intentionally. So it's one thing to start thankfully, it's one thing to become you know, confident in my next step and my specific prayer that I'm praying of God, but then what do I do between that and God showing up? What do I do in the middle ground? What do I do in the battleground for my mind and my thoughts? What do I do when I'm battling the faith battle? Paul says you're gonna have to be intentional on what you let your mind and your heart dwell on. Because what you let your mind and your heart dwell on in the in-between will determine how much peace you have or how much anxiety rules your heart and your mind. Meditation, scripturally, is not just the process of, uh, of thinking about things or just mulling something over in your mind. It's actually much more active than that. When we were pastoring in California, we, I was teaching on meditation, and of course, California, for a lot of people, meditation means something different than it does for those of us maybe that have grown up in the middle of the country and around a lot of people that have gone to church, and, and this gal came up to me after church and she said, oh, I, I meditate every day in yoga, pastor. I'm so glad you're teaching on that. It helps me so much. And I thought, okay, we got some work to do. Listen, yoga meditation is that Eastern meditation is actually starting on the right principle, which is I need to be quiet. That's what we just talked about. There's power in just that moment. However, 
Eastern meditation is the process of emptying myself so that I can fill myself with myself and focus on myself and be my best self and, and help myself and, and be more of me and the best me I can be. And it's all it's about refilling myself with myself. The problem with that is yourself is the problem. You don't need more of yourself. You need something different. So meditation scripturally is different. Meditation scripturally and the reason people find peace in that moment of meditation is because it's, this is a little bit of Jesus, you know, what, what God said, I caused the rain to fall on the just and the unjust, right? There, there's, there's truth in it, so it works. But there's more. It's not enough just to empty yourself. You have to refill yourself with something. Meditation is the process of refilling yourself with the right things so you're focused on the right things, so your mind and your heart are in the right place. Here's the power of what it means to meditate scripturally. Your mind and your heart were not made for the world that you live in. So the world that you live in will beat your mind and your heart up. So what you allow your mind to stay on and your heart to dwell on will determine what, how, how fragile, how breakable, and how hurt your mind and your heart get. Let me illustrate it this way. I brought some eggs with me today. Brought some eggs with me today. These are just, just, just for those of you in the audience that care. These are uh, hens that, that are free to roam, nest and perch in a protected barn. I think they're prayed over every night, anointed with oil. These are so these are these are these are good eggs. Okay. Now here's what I'm gonna do. This is this is so silly. There are, there are a bunch of different ways I could illustrate this, but this is the way we're going with this morning. All right, come on, somebody. Here we go. Okay. So what I'm gonna do uh, is I'm gonna I'm gonna balance this egg on the end of my finger. And I'm really, you should know this going in, I'm really good at balancing things. It's just a, a, a gift that I have. I can juggle lots of, lots of things like that. So how many of you think I, I'm gonna do a good job of balancing this egg on the end of my finger? <laughs> Y'all don't believe in Ethan, let's just pray and go home. I told you I'm really good at balancing things. How many of you after that little pep talk think I can do it, think I'm gonna pull this off? I'm not, it's not gonna be good, okay. We're gonna bounce this egg on the end of it. I wish I had like a drum roll. All right, here we go. The production team is, yeah, there you go. The production team is running to grab mops right now. All right, here we go. So I'm just, when I feel like I've got it kind of balanced, I'm just gonna let it go. Kind of what I thought would happen. Didn't really practice it, didn't really know what was going on. Now here's, we're just gonna get close to this egg for a second, get cozy. Was that that egg's fault? Did that egg do anything wrong? Oh, Ethan's an idiot. You don't, you don't drop an egg. It's not what you do with an egg. Why did that egg break? It's because that's what eggs do. I preached this last night. One of my friends shot me a picture this morning. He was making eggs and saying it's contagious. He dropped an egg on the kitchen floor. He said, I've never dropped an egg before. <laughs> what happens when eggs drop? They break. It's what eggs do. It's not the egg's fault. Listen really carefully. When your heart hurts, when your mind is bent, you're stressed, you can't sleep, you have a panic attack, you have no idea what you're gonna do next, you're worried. It's not your fault. It's what happens to minds and hearts in this world. You see, friend, your heart and your mind were not made for this world. If I were to take this same egg, I'd put it in this basket. Okay, now, now how many of you think I'm gonna hold it? And I'm, I'm not gonna drop it, right? It's like, of course, of course, of course I'm not, right? Now watch, watch, watch. I can put it in here. We can do the same drum roll, right? We can get just the same, same amount of tension in the room. Like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen to the egg? I don't know what's going to happen to the egg. I can hide it in here. I can put it in here. I can put it right up here on this thing. Put it right up there. I can just watch it. We're going to be here all day. It's going to be the longest service ever. Nothing's going to happen to the egg. Now, did anything, that's not a magic egg. It's the same eggs that were in that thing. Did anything change about this egg? Nothing changed about the egg. The egg did not suddenly become made of steel. The egg did not suddenly change its form. The egg did not suddenly find a new boldness and a new strategy for surviving the fall. The only thing that changed about the egg was where it was held. That's it. 
Many of us struggle mentally and spiritually because we're trying to change what we're made of. The answer for mental health, the answer for what you're going through, the answer for your mind and your heart is not suddenly to be made of something different so you can survive this world. The answer for you is to change where your mind and your heart are held. And I believe God brought me here this weekend to tell somebody that where you've been broken, where you are struggling, where you are hurting, where you've been abused and you're afraid to trust people, where you've let yourself down and you're not sure you can move past it, the places when you get quietest, you feel the worst, the bruises that you have on your heart, listen, they're not your fault. There's nothing wrong with you. You were made to be fragile. You were made to be gentle. Your heart was made to be soft. You were made for Eden. You were made to be naked and unashamed. You were made to live for eternity in a city where the streets are made of gold. And there's a river of life, and there's a tree that produces 12 different kinds of crops every different month so you can be nourished in 12 different ways. And those, that fruit brings healing to the nations, Revelation says. You were made to live in the presence of God that wipes away every tear from every eye. You were made to walk in the garden with God in the cool of the day. You were not made for a world that beats your heart up and drops you. And the answer for your mental health and your anxiety is not to try to balance it as carefully as you can, holding on for dear life, hoping you don't drop it. Paul says the way that you move from trying to balance so carefully to being held so securely is the meditation of your mind and where your heart dwells. Two beautiful verses on this. Psalm 1914 says this, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Psalm 91, 1 says this, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Where does your heart dwell? What do you dwell on? Isaiah 26, 3 says, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. You keep him in what kind of peace? Perfect peace. Who? the person whose mind is stayed on you. Meditation, meditation, meditation scripturally is changing where my mind stays and my heart dwells. Where does your mind stay? Where does your heart dwell? And depending on what level you deal with stress and anxiety, depression and fear, you're gonna have to take this more seriously. If you're in a season of life where you're feeling like, man, Ethan, things are good and things are, things are going pretty good, I'm pretty happy, then maybe for you the step this week is just to, just to let life catch up with you a little bit and make sure there's nothing going on under the surface, no little foxes that are robbing you of, of things that, that, that you could have in God, make sure that you're doing good. But for you, scrolling the news is not that big of a deal. For you, being on social media doesn't cause you that much stress. For you, watching a show on Netflix or, or spending time doing something entertaining is not a big deal. For, the, for others of us, there's a mental battle happening right now. Gang, listen, calls to suicide hotlines are up 5,000% from this time last year. That's not a small number of people that are struggling more than ever before. The next generation growing up, my teenage boys are growing up in a generation that are identifying almost 100% as dealing with some level of anxiety behind the scenes that their parents don't know about. This is not a minor issue. And if you want to have serious peace in the middle of a world that doesn't give it, you're going to have to take seriously where you allow your mind to stay and your heart to dwell. Don't scroll, stop, put it away. Take a step back from it. Allow the words of God and the presence of God to be more uh, uh, vibrant, bright, and uh, occupying more of your mind than anything else because when you do what you're doing is you're saying this. Let's rewind to where we started, Paul in prison. 
I can't change the fact that my body is in prison, but I can change where my heart and my mind are. I can change where those things dwell. I can change the address of what's going on inside of me from earth to eternity, from this life to the next, from my presence to God's presence. And in God's presence, there's fullness of joy. He inhabits the praises of his people. He gives us the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. There's something that happens when I transfer ownership of my thoughts, what occupies my mind and what occupies my heart to God. I find peace. And if you want peace over anxiety, you're gonna have to be willing to take the process of meditation seriously. But Paul says this, oh friends, if you'll start thankfully and pray specifically and just meditate intentionally, you will find that anxiety goes down so quickly and the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Cast your care on him, Peter says, for he cares for you. Second Corinthians says we take thoughts captive that, that try to get over or exalt themselves above our knowledge of God. It's a process of battling in our mind, but when you do, when you say, God, I'm gonna focus on you, I'm gonna turn you up and turn this down, God promises that you're gonna have a supernatural peace, and here's the beauty. Supernatural peace has an inverse relationship to understanding. He says this peace, it passes your understanding. What does that mean? It means that natural peace goes up when my understanding goes up. The more I understand, the more peace I have. What did Jesus say in John 14? Peace I give you, but not peace like the world gives you, a different kind of peace. Supernatural peace works opposite. Supernatural peace can go up even when my understanding goes down. It's like a seesaw. I don't, I, supernatural peace is the kind, the kind of peace that God's people have and they go, what's, what's wrong with you? Why you should be stressed out and freaked out and worried about it. You go, I, I don't know, I, I know. I don't know how it's all gonna work out. I don't have all the answers, but I just know this, God's at work and I have peace. That's the kind of peace that God's people are called to have. So I would love to do this today. I just, I'd love to take just a second and pray for you. And I'd love to take just a second to give you the gift of sitting in God's presence, taking a deep breath, and just asking yourself, where am I on this process? Where am I on the process of putting peace over anxiety? Where is my heart dwelling? Where's my mind staying? And just for a second, with some beautiful piano music filling the room, would you just close your eyes, bow your head? This is what it looks like. There's lots of stuff outside these doors. Turn it off for just a second. There's other stuff to think about. There's, you, you, there's like your phone's buzzing in your purse and your foot itches. I get it. Just for just a second. Whew. Take a deep breath. Allow the presence of God to be bigger and brighter than the other stuff. What he said, what she didn't do, the money you're worried about, the health thing. Put it all to the side for just a second. God, I pray that you would fill our churches with supernatural peace. Jesus, I'm so thankful that you loved us so much that you would give your very life so that we could have an audience with, with our Heavenly Father that we could come boldly before your throne of grace and find mercy and favor in our time of need. God, we come into your presence. We lay every burden at your feet. We lay every stress. We just ask you to be bigger than what we're facing. Satan, I rebuke you off the minds and the hearts of the people of church on the move. I take authority of every strategy of the enemy to bring depression, despair into the hearts of our people I command every thought of worthlessness to leave. I command every thought of walking away, of bowing out, I command it to leave. I declare that the identity of Christ resides within the people of God. The Holy Spirit lives in us. We are the temple of God. We are not our own, we're bought with a price. 
I am not my own. The life I live is hidden in Christ because Christ died for me. I now live everything that I do. I live and breathe and have my being in him. And I, I just declare over our churches this morning, I declare every, over every man, woman, and child, the peace of God will rule our hearts and our minds. It will reign in our lives. It will have authority. We put ourselves under your kingship, Jesus, and we just say, would you help us to operate in peace this week? This morning, here's what I'd love to do. I think it would be a shame to talk about transferring the ownership of our mind and our heart without giving you an opportunity to follow Jesus. So if you're here and you say, Ethan, I don't have a relationship with God, or you say, I, I have, but not like what you're talking about. I need to give my heart to Christ. I need to start again because I've been doing it on my own and it's just not working. And if you gave me a chance today, I'd love to restart my relationship with God. If that's you, I'd love to know who you are. I'm not gonna embarrass you, I would not do that for anything, but I just wanna help you, I wanna pray for you and I wanna help you take a next step on your journey with Jesus. If that's you, say, Ethan, yeah, that's me, I wanna start a relationship with God or I wanna come home, right there at your seat, would you be bold enough just to raise up your hand, just say, Ethan, yeah, that's me. You can put your hand right back down, I see that. You can just put it right back down, you say, that's me. I see that hand, that's awesome. You can just put it right back down, I'm so proud of you, I see that hand, you can just say, that's me, Ethan, that's me, I, th I thank you. I see, I, the hands have gone up all over the room, that's awesome, that's awesome. Here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna pray what we call our believer's prayer. For all of us, this is an opportunity to recenter our heart on Jesus. But if you pray this prayer with us, if you jump in and pray this prayer with us, God will do what only he can do. He'll meet you right where you are. He'll forgive your sins and give you a brand new start. So church, let's pray this together. Say this, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus for me. I believe he died but rose again so that I could have new life. I choose to follow you. I give you my heart. Thank you for meeting me right here. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. Hey, would you put your hands together with me and celebrate with everybody that prayed that prayer, maybe for the first time? Now, here's your assignment. Take the step that's in front of you, and maybe today on the way out of the parking lot, it's just being thankful for the guys in the green jackets that are keeping you in a long line. Come on, somebody. Like, start thankfully and you watch what God does with your peace level. Would you stand? If you prayed that prayer together right outside of each of these doors, we have a next steps table and a group of people that have been praying for you all week. Would you stop by that table? Let us know you prayed that prayer. Also, after service, we're celebrating water baptism. We do this to go public in our faith. If you follow Jesus, you need to be water baptized. If you go to our baptism room, it's right underneath these bleachers. Our team would love to walk you through everything. Now, let me pray a blessing over you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance on you and give you peace. Go out and have a great week. We love you guys.